and there we go. So once again, here is our agenda for the webinar this afternoon. Before we move into the pres presentations, a couple of quick housekeeping items. We will be keeping everyone on mute throughout the webinar, but if you have any technical issues or problems, please use the chat box to notify us and my colleague Selena will try and assist you. The webinar is now being recorded and you will receive an email with the slides and recording in the near future. There will be four presentations in the order shown, followed by a question and answer period. During the presentations, we encourage you to type your questions into the chat box and send to everyone. It is helpful if you can indicate uh, if your question is for a particular presenter or you can pose a general question. So before we get started, I'd like to invite you to indicate which sector you work in via a quick pop-up poll. And please note that your responses are strictly anonymous. So you should all now see a poll appearing on your screen. If you could select the sector that you work in. And I'll give everyone another few seconds to respond. I still see some answers coming in. Last call for poll responses. Anyone else? Great, thank you everyone for for doing that. I will just briefly show the results here on the screen and you can see we have uh, quite a, a wide variety uh, of sectors represented on the call today with uh, folks working for municipalities being uh, the largest group. So thank you very much for that. And now let's dive in. With today's webinar, Signs of the Time, Best Practices in School Wayfinding, we wanted to highlight the growing number of communities that are using various types of wayfinding initiatives to encourage more walking and, cy and cycling to school. As you will see shortly, wayfinding can, can include not only many different types of signs, but also, also other measures, such as stencils on sidewalks and flexible bollards in roadways. These examples are all slightly different yet share many similar objectives, like increasing the visibility of key routes to schools and making them safer and more engaging for students. We are pleased to have presenters from four communities to share their experiences and offer advice. From London, Ontario, we have two presenters with us today. First, Sabrina Sater, who is supervisor of the Neighborhood Development and Support Program with the City of London. With a passion for creating healthy and vibrant neighborhoods, she has been a member of the local Active and Safe Routes to School Steering Committee and led implementation of London's first school wayfinding pilot project. This included training facilitators to expand the program to seven schools in the London area. She is joined today by Jill Takas, who holds a Bachelor of Health Sciences degree specializing in health promotion from Western University in London, where she is currently working as a summer research intern with the Human Environments Analysis Laboratory, or HEAL. Jill is also an incoming graduate student at the Queen's University School of Kinesiology and Health Studies. They will be followed by Rena Mystery, from York Region. Rena is the active travel coordinator at the York Region District and York Catholic District School Boards. Her role includes working closely with community stakeholders to build capacity to support active school travel and developing new initiatives to support behavior change. Rena holds a master's in applied environmental studies from the University of Waterloo and previously worked for the City of Markham and Malone Given Parsons. She will be followed by Francois Pierrat from the city of Gatineau in Quebec. Francois is the active transportation coordinator with the city of Gatineau. Through his previous academic studies and professional experience in his native Belgium, 
as well as in the Netherlands and the UK. He has acquired extensive knowledge of best practices in active transportation and transit and overseen the development and implementation of multiple related projects. And last but not least today, we welcome Sheldon Koo from the City of Toronto, where he is a senior engineer in the city's transportation services division. Sheldon is currently leading the team responsible for managing road safety studies and planning and programming road safety improvements as part of Toronto's five-year Vision Zero Road Safety Plan. Sheldon is a graduate of the Civil Engineering Pro Program at McMaster University, and he is a registered professional engineer. So without any uh, further ado, I'm going to turn things over to uh, Sabrina and Jill for our first presentation from the City of London. Thanks so much, Wallace. I'm just going to share my screen here and then we'll get started. All right, how does that look? That looks perfect, Sabrina. Fantastic. It's over to you. Perfect, thanks. So hello everyone. Uh, my name is Sabrina Sater and I'm co-presenting today with Jill, Ta Jill Takis. We're going to be sharing our learnings from the school wayfinding signage project that took place here in London and surrounding area. So this program was an initiative from our local active and safe routes to school, which includes the counties of Elgin, Middlesex, Oxford, and the cities of London and St. Thomas. So London found inspiration from Waterloo School Signage Project, which took place in 2014. Their project consisted of signs and sidewalk markings, as you can see in the photo. Um, we did not include sidewalk markings in our project, but we did provide bike racks to some schools as an accompaniment to the signs because it was identified as a barrier to active school travel in many school travel plans. Waterloo conducted a process evaluation, which we gained a lot from. We followed all of the recommendations for our London pilot, which took place in 2017 at St. Margaret Deville Catholic Elementary School. The signage project was used as an intervention for the school travel plan there, as they were struggling with high numbers of parents driving students and in turn vehicle congestion in front of the school. Ultimately, the learnings cultivated from the Waterloo pilot, as well as the St. Margaret Deville pilot, informed the process and practices used in the expansion of the program to seven other schools in London and the area. So we were able to scale up the project using two sources of funding that were awarded to the ACERTS committee. The first being um, from London's Child News Network. So they provided financial supports to the program, as well as in-kind uh, supports with coordination. We also received a grant through the Active, uh, Ontario Active School Travel Fund in 2018. And so we used the project cost from our pilot to develop estimates and determine how many schools we could support with the funding we received. I've omitted bike racks from the cost breakdown there and focused strictly on wayfinding. Um, and when we were allocating for funding for wayfinding signs, we used a high end estimate of 16 signs per school to be on the safe side and that worked really well for us. Ultimately, each school had about 12 to 16 signs and the number that you see in the chart there that's just over $2,000 per school was really the only financial cost. We were able to save a lot of money by having a lot of in-kind support. So the resource development, coordination, facilitation of the program were all in-kind from ACERT's committee members. Another big savings for us was from using the City of London Sign Shop, um, which, was, um, which was able to provide us with signage materials at cost. So obviously very low compared to commercial businesses. Speaking of signage, uh, here are the signs that we created for London. So of course on the left hand side, we have our wayfinding si uh, sign. And on the right, uh, we have a sign that we call the arrival sign. And um, those signs were installed at the entrances of the school ground. We typically had two to three signs, uh, arrival signs at each school, and students really enjoyed um, engaging with those signs. Some things worth mentioning in regards to the design of these signs are that students um, were involved in the design process, and it was an incredible promotional and educational opportunity for both sides, so I highly recommend doing that. Um, one of our first sign designs in as far as its shape and size looked very similar to a London transit sign that we had. So I would just highly encourage people to consider other signage in the community while developing their sign design. 
Um, we also, uh, our sign is 18 by 24 inches and uh, honestly it could be slightly bigger. So my best advice is to bring a prototype on location and leave it there for a little while um, to see what works best for your community. Um, and lastly, we added school route to our sign to really highlight to drivers that they are driving in a school zone and just to be extra alert and cautious for students traveling. And by the way, if anyone's interested in um, the artwork, we'd be more than happy to, to share it. So in terms of route and site selection, we put signs along three to five main routes to the school. Um, with two to three signs along each route. And as you can see on the map, we tried to have signs at the 500 meter, one kilometer and 1.6 kilometer range. Anything outside of that falls within busing boundaries at our city. And so in choosing routes, we considered high traffic secondary collector roads for visibility. We also looked at SDP data, um, baseline data, which included traffic counts and other important information such as travel behaviors and perceptions. We also tried to choose routes that had appropriate crossing areas um, and that were ac as accessible as possible. But most importantly, we relied on the school community through many, many conversations to identify the most um, walked routes and the best areas for the signs. So as far as um, implementation, it was very much community driven. Community members, including students, parents, and faculty, were all part of the discussions and decision making from the beginning to the very end. Um, but it did all start with um, an ACERT subcommittee that created the structure for the rollout of the program. For school selection, there was an expression of interest process, which was only open to past and present STP schools. We chose to keep it exclusive to STP schools due to limited funding and for sustainability purposes. And in addition to the subcommittee, we also had um, project coordinators who managed budgets, collected finalized mapping data, and communicated with delivery agents, including the City of London Roads and Transportation for approval of sign location, and the City Sign Shop for manufacturing and installation. And the coordinators also supported the project facilitators who were leading the engagement of the school community in the route and site selection process, as well as other aspects of the project like promotions. Um, our facilitators were all school nurses um, and for the majority were also STP co-chairs at their school. Now I'll pass it along to Jill for evaluation and learning. All right, thank you, Sabrina. So to evaluate the success and overall status of the Wayfinding Signs program, ACERTS uses three major methods of evaluation. First, we have the program evaluation, which was developed by the HEAL and was comprised of a one-time survey that was distributed to key facilitators of the Wayfinding Signs program at each participating school. The goal of the survey was to obtain important information from the facilitators regarding the Wayfinding Signs process, uh, and this was to help support future program development. Questions were aimed at understanding what went well and what could be improved on, in addition to what the facilitators liked or disliked and whether they'd um, recommend participation in the program overall. We received a lot of detailed feedback from facilitators, which is really great. Um, however, it's important to keep in mind that the survey was distributed nearly a year after the signs were installed. Therefore, program evaluation likely included some form of recall bias. Um, so in the future, it might be helpful to distribute an implementation or process survey while the signs are being installed or shortly thereafter. The annual STP Action Plan Report is a general overview of the status of the school travel plan, and that's provided by the school's public health nurse. The STP follow-up survey questionnaire is distributed two years after the initial implementation of the school travel plan. So the goal of the questionnaire is to assess awareness of wayfinding signs and other interventions that took place during the two-year STP Action Plan period. Due to the timeline of the school travel plan implementation, there have been no follow-ups to date. However, as this happens, we're happy to share the information and survey results with green communities. Um, now, just a note on the sustainability of the programs. Um, because the Wayfinding Signs projects are attached to the school travel plan, evaluation of the impact of the program is built into the follow-up survey. So if a school wasn't ready to adopt a full school travel plan and chose to instead use only the Wayfinding Signs project, it might be difficult to evaluate without the pre-existing infrastructure um, and the in-kind resources of STP committees. Okay, so based on information from the program evaluation and a blend of personal experience, 
we've identified key successes and challenges with the City of London's wayfinding signs implementation process. First, school communities were highly, highly engaged with the wayfinding project, likely due to several reasons. There was no cost to the school to implement this program. Uh, wayfinding utilizes schools' existing school travel plan committee, so the school community already had a lot of interest in the project and they are ready to promote it. Uh, it was a unique project that the school community was excited to try. Students were highly engaged with assigned development, as Sabrina explained earlier. Um, and second, the expression of interest ensured school readiness and determined alignment of the Wayfinding Science project to other programs. Third, the mapping process used large maps printed from the city with different layers, showing things like streetlights and pedestrian crossovers, uh, and that was important in helping guide sign location. We also used Google Street View to identify the exact location where we wanted the signs installed. Additionally, we identified the direction the arrow on the sign should point, uh, and this is really helpful with the graphic design um, element of the process. Fourth, the promotional and educational materials were ready for schools to use, and this included uh, consistent messaging, which eased the time and effort of the school travel planning committees. And regarding the challenges we experienced, county schools had a different site selection process in city schools, uh, and because of this, there are unique concerns relating to political issues that had to be considered, such as sign pollution and sign design. The timeline of sign installation was challenging as well, as signs were installed toward the end of the school year, which made the promotion of the Wayfinding Signs program difficult. Additionally, sign installation sometimes took longer than expected, which hindered the full, excuse me, the full rollout of the program. Finally, school labor issues made it difficult to continuously promote and monitor the program. Perfect. So um, there are a number of key considerations that we believe are important to the success of the Wayfinding Project. Um, and so I'll go over those quickly. So we cannot stress enough how important it is uh, to time your project ap appropriately. We had given ourselves an entire school year for the expression of interest process, training facilitators, route and site selection, and the creation and installation of the signs. But um, the signs weren't installed until the end of the year, which made it, uh, again, very difficult to promote and completely roll out the program. So our suggestion would be to um, conduct the school selection process in the spring and then pre-schedule um, an end of August or early September training and re-engage the school community again in September. And definitely do not start the program until all stakeholders are committed to timelines while also keeping in mind that despite your best efforts there will be some unexpected delays at every level so just leave room for that. In terms of uh, school readiness, that's another important factor that can affect timelines, of course. So just assuring that schools are prepared to take on the project by having the capacity to have several meetings regarding mapping, the ability to promote the signs and um, to implement programming around the signs. It's also particularly important that schools have a group, of uh, a group of individuals dedicated to executing the project. So it's really about school ownership um, at, yeah, and uh, it doesn't have to be an SDP related committee. It can be healthy schools committee, parent subcommittee, um, whatever has the capacity really. And with that said, we know that all schools vary in capacity and engagement. Um, so it's important when choosing schools to participate. Um, and you choose ones that may, might not be able to fundraise for the program if you are funding it. Um, you also um, may want to consider providing some additional human resources uh, to those schools specifically as it is a bit intensive on, on that end. And um, Another important aspect is setting schools up for success uh, by providing them with educational and promotional materials and perhaps a list of programming ideas uh, to accom accompany the signs. It's also helpful to provide clear expectations for the project, something that our expression of interest process was able to do for us. And of course, um, building in multiple opportunities to evaluate your project so that you can learn uh, from your own community and build a case for any funding that may become available. And lastly, we believe it is absolutely vital to engage the school community and beyond. We had ward counselors promoting the project and gathering feedback from the larger community um, on the school's behalf. We had engineers attending STP committee meetings uh, during their site selection process, which was extremely helpful in educating and engaging parents and faculty in the process. Um, invite students to the table, engage parents at functions like parent teacher night, the more input and influence the community has over the entire process, the more buy-in um, and participation there will be based on what we've seen locally. And with that, we um, wrap up our presentation. So 
There was a lot to cover in a limited amount of time. So please, if you have any questions or want to dig deeper into what we presented, please do not hesitate to reach out or use the chat function. Our resources are available on our website at activeandsaferoots.ca. But for more information or to access items that are not available on the website, please do not hesitate to contact us. Thanks so much. Great. Thanks so much, uh, Sabrina and Jill. I do see a couple of questions uh, uh, for you in the chat box. So as we transition to our next presentation, Arena Mystery from York Region, feel free to, uh, to dive into those questions if you'd like. And if we don't get to them all, we'll of course cover them in the, uh, in the question and answer period at the end. So over to Arena Mystery in York Region. Thank you, Wallace. Um, can you hear me? You're loud and clear. Okay, great. Hi, everyone. Thank you for inviting us here to present on our wayfinding signage work in the city of Markham, New York region. This work is part of the Markham Active School Travel Pilot and was built on a local partnership and funding from Green Communities Canada and the Government of Ontario. The local partners include both York Region District School Board and York Catholic District School Board, the city of Markham and York Region. Our project is inspired by both the City of Toronto and Region of Waterloo experience. The Markham Active School Travel Pilot is built on an experience and feedback received from the former Spring 2018 AST pilot conducted by the City. This current pilot is testing a number of tools, including wayfinding signage, to encourage more active school travel at nine schools across the City. The goal is to improve sustainability of active school travel programs and get more kids walking and cycling to and from school. The current pilot is structured to evaluate and understand the effectiveness of each tool and is based on a tiered system with baseline data. It also involves working with teacher and parent champions as well as students. The pilot initially began in November 2018, which is when we recruited schools, got parent counsel and school admin buy-in. The pilot officially launched in May 2019 and began with ASD assemblies, newsletters to parents and staff, and kickoff events at all. Um, pardon me, at all uh, nine schools. The pilot originally was only going to take place for two months. However, um, with funding from um, Green Communities as well as our partners, we, will, we were able to extend our pilot to June 2020. One of the key components of this pilot is our project partnerships with different stakeholders. We have found so far that these partnerships are very valuable and key to sustaining the program, including resources and expertise. To our partners who might be listening, thank you so far for all your help. The pilot is based on six tiers. As you can see from this chart, each tier builds upon each other. The wayfinding piece is part of our tier four and is one tool of a number of tools we are testing as part of this pilot. The pilot considers all five E's, including encouragement, education, enforcement, engineering, and evaluation. So you can see the way finding signage is part of um, many tools that we're using to try to get kids walking and cycling more often. The next few slides describe the process that we use to implement our wayfinding signage. How did we select the schools we were going to work with? We used a host of criteria to determine which schools would be ideal candidates and together with the city, of Markham narrowed down a list. The criteria included schools that were previously engaged in STP, schools that had ongoing site and community traffic issues, schools that had parent and uh, teacher buy-in, um, including um, an identification of champions. Um, and we also um, looked at neighborhoods and school zones with existing sidewalk networks. Um, part of um, our site selections was also, um, we considered um, some urban urban planning characteristics, um, including urban planning styles of the different communities, as well as the age of different communities. Once we selected our schools, we needed to decide where to place the signage. We created walking maps using the new service area tool in ArcGIS. Two data sets are required for creating these maps. The first is the school locations, and the second is the street network. The new service area tool draws walking routes based on specified walking distance from the closest point for a school along the road network. In our walking maps, we use increments of 300 meters, each representing five minute walking trips, which is based on the average 
speed for young children. The tool joins all the endpoints of walking routes to create the polygons which make walking time zones. So here you can see is an example of the map we created for each school. At the time we conducted our analysis, it also included student location data, which for confidentiality reasons I couldn't include today, but this allowed us to identify clusters of where um, students are located and determine where uh, to place signage. Along with student location, we also considered um, intersections that were um, within the walking zones and um, close to the school. We also looked for a continuous um, sidewalk network. Uh, we considered um, what would potentially be the main walking and cycling routes. Um, we looked for areas that were highly uh, visible to place signage. Um, we looked for existing pole and post availability so we could use um, posts and poles that were um, already available. Um, we tried to consider um, three to four locations per, um, uh, pardon me, per time zone. Um, but again, that just depended on um, our, our, all the criteria that we looked at. Um, and then we also used our professional judgment based on our experience in the communities. Once we determined locations, we did a walkabout to confirm our site selections and created signage implementation plans. Here's another example of another map. You can see um, the first map I presented is a, a newer community. This is an older community and you can you can see already how the sidewalk network differs and why it's important um, to look at these characteristics just because it's not going to be the same for every community. Um, there's gaps um, in different neighborhoods that have to be considered. So while we're determining our locations, um, we also had to think about what we wanted these signs to look like. We worked with the city's communication department um, and, and explained our goal. What, what is it that we were trying to achieve? We provided best practices from other cities um, and we came up with a few drafts um, of what we, what we had in mind before uh, we designed the final product. We wanted it to be bright, we wanted it to be appealing, fun, and we wanted it to stand out. Once the design was completed, the city's sign shop created the signs and posted them as per our signage implementation plan. Um, the size of the signs are 30 centimeters by 45 centimeters and are based on OTM guidelines. Uh, we also thought about the height and location of the signs um, to consider student height and pedestrian visibility. Um, just from this example, you can see one of the iterations. We had a skipper for um, the walking um, icon, but we then moved on um, to represent um, walking. Once the signs were implemented, we had walking maps uh, created with the signage um, locations. These maps were then shared um, with all the schools that were participating um, in the pilot. So the signs, um, sorry, the maps not only highlight where the signs are located, but it also provides an idea of the estimated walking times around the community, as well as um, uh, other features such as the sidewalk, uh, uh, sidewalk network. Here's another example. This is the second, the older neighborhood. So again, you can, you can see the difference um, in, in communities. These are some on the ground examples of what the signs look like today. Um, just different, there's, there's one on a light pole, there's one on an existing stop sign pole, just to give you an idea. Um, we had one other color, I believe it was orange, and, but these were the three colors that, we, um, that we've used so far. This has been a fairly cost-effective tool. Uh, the cost of the signs um, for us has been approximately 70, 17 pardon me, um, dollars per sign with a small labor fee. Um, and it was done in-house um, by the city of Markham's sign shop. So um, like the previous project, we were also able to save costs by um, working with the city's sign shop. So far we've installed 69 signs, including um, seven, um, of the nine schools, and we have two more schools remaining in our plan to be installed um, this summer. summer. Um, so I had mentioned this earlier, we do have a variety of funding sources, um, and so all these funding sources have helped us um, complete our project so far. Um, so like any good project, it comes with its challenges and its opportunities. Um, so some of the challenges we've had with our wayfinding signage is 
knowing the actual student roots. I mean, we, we did do a vigorous exercise to try to um, figure out what they might be, but you know, is it is it the right um, location? That's something that um, we're always sort of thinking about. Um, older neighborhoods versus new neighborhoods, just because the layout and the sidewalk network. Um, so that was a that was a challenge for us. The labor destruction has um, interrupted our data collection. Um, so uh, going forward, uh, we will be um, extending the timeline of our project, but we will have a gap in our data. And then future maintenance, who will take responsibility once the pilot is over? And some of the positives, um, the signage has enhanced the public realm and public awareness of walking and cycling. So that's added a really um, nice uh, feature to our communities. Uh, we've already received a lot of positive feedback from parents, residents, and counselors. Um, and like I mentioned, this is a very cost-effective and easy to implement um, uh, project. Some future opportunities that we see if we expand on our wayfinding signage um, at other schools, um, maybe allowing students and parents um, input for the signage location so we can get the right, um, or we, we can uh, relate a little bit more to the right locations of where the, the signage could be placed. Um, expanding to more schools in Markham and York region and working with um, local AT organizations such as Smart Commute to further um, promote and enhance um, our wayfinding signage. Um, our next steps, we're going to continue to implement our pilot. Uh, we're going to evaluate our results um, once, we, once we finish collecting our data. Um, we're hoping to do a presentation at the board, the city, and regional council to get more support and resources um, in hopes to expand the successful components um, of our pilot to more schools across the region. Um, we want to use this um, to help us build our active school travel kit building on what the, the most ideal and um, successful school zone should look like. Um, and we wanna share our pilot experience with um, other communities and other professionals. Uh, we have implemented a data collection process where we frequently uh, count the number of students um, through the hands up survey. Um, so this is done once a month for an entire week. And like I said, it was supposed to be for the whole school year, um, but uh, because of the, dis the two disruptions now, um, we, we will have a gap. Um, we had plans to survey parents at the end of the school year. Um, so we'll be pushing that back, but we definitely will be getting feedback from the parents, um, feedback from residents, comments that come through um, the, um, the municipal office, um, as well as observing um, pick up and drop off activity um, within the school site and around um, the streets. Um, so we are still in the middle of our pilot and we don't have conclusive results at this time, but we can report a positive experience from our communities and partners. Uh, if you have any questions, um, please feel free to reach out um, either of those email addresses. Um, otherwise, that's all I have for now. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, uh, Rena. And indeed, there are a number of questions in the, in the chat room, uh, some of which are, uh, I think, targeted at you. Just as we're uh, transitioning over to uh, Francois' presentation, just a reminder to everyone that um, it is helpful if your question is for uh, a specific presenter, perhaps the one that you're, uh, you're listening to as you type your question, if you could just, just specify that. If it's a more of a general question, that's, that's great. We'll pick those up and cover those in the Q&A session after our presentations are over. So I can see that Francois is ready to go. And uh, yes, hello. Great, we can hear you loud and clear, Francois, over to you. Perfect, is my screen okay, everybody can see? It looks wonderful to me. Perfect, so hello everyone. Thanks again, Wallace, for this invitation and opportunity to share with other communities and, and uh, nonprofit organization and all sorts of uh, actors uh, across Ontario. Uh, my name is Francois Pirard. I am active transportation uh, coordinator at the city of Gatineau in Quebec. I will share our experience about a wayfinding project around the routes to school called uh, Corridor Scolaire that started in 2017. You, you may see that it might differ a little bit with the other projects that were presented. 
as it uh, um, also was um, a goal to uh, put some traffic calming measures. So Gatineau has been involved in uh, various projects to increase uh, walking and cycling to school, uh, majoritively since uh, the sustainable, sustainable Mobility Plan in 2013. Uh, we collaborate with partners so that schools have travel plans and uh, the city created an education and encouragement program to teach safe walking behavior to kids called a pied vélo je suis capable. Basically we work on all the dimensions related to, uh, to safe route to schools and to, to, to have more children uh, walking and cycling to, to school. The project uh, that I will focus on today uh, had several objectives, uh, increase children's safety on their way to school and around them, improve the visibility of safe routes to school for children and drivers. So we already have had uh, some work done to identify uh, the safe route to school called the Corridor Scolaire for all the schools, uh, that all the public schools that were uh, selected, uh, remind the drivers of the presence of, of nearby schools, uh, encourage the students and parents to use school corridors that um, that are existing, that were already existing but didn't have signage yet, and promote healthy lifestyle by walking and cycling. So the measures, uh, first and foremost, there was uh, the wayfinding signage along the school corridors. Um, the installation of flexible bollards were also uh, used along all the, the school corridors. Um, I'll show you uh, examples of where we were, where we put them um, later on. Um, we also improved pavement marking along the corridors, so symbols, pedestrian crossing, and and uh, stop lines to reinforce the reinforce the message that this was a route to school. And um, other interventions were also conducted, such as uh, related to vegetation, uh, sidewalk maintenance, or even creating new curb ramps. And we also collaborated with a project of Spear Radar uh, to, uh, to assess the, the efficiency of the measures, but also to, to decrease the speed of, uh, of, uh, of, school, of cars, sorry. So uh, the project uh, started in the spring of 2017 and ended up, the pilot project uh, ended up in the fall of 2018. Um, the first phase went from spring 2017 to winter uh, 2018, where we uh, did a diagnostics uh, for the first five schools. We installed the measures in the summer and we conducted a survey in the fall of uh, 2017 to assess the measures. With uh, phase two started in the winter of 2018 and uh, 17 and 18 and ended up in the fall. So that's uh, basically um, uh, directed to 10 schools across the region. So for the ones that are not familiar with the region of Gatineau, Ottawa is the city directly to the south of the river. Um, so I wanted to show you just a few before and after pictures uh, illustrating the key measures along, along the route to school. And uh, here's what, uh, what, what a, a key intersection was looking like before our project um, and what it looked like after. So you can see uh, that we, we added the wayfinding signs, uh, but also flexible bollers uh, at the corner of the intersections uh, to reduce the curb radius, but also the width of a pedestrian crossing. And finally, uh, you can see that the markings from before and after are <laughs> really different. Um, this is another intersection, another uh, a route to another school and uh, and this is what it looked like after so that's actually phase two of the project and as, as you can see the borders uh, already changed so we did some adjustments and the borders were of the color of the the wayfinding signs so that it could be used also as a wayfinding uh, uh, element so we use the combination of school travel plans recommendations and google street maps uh, to identify uh, wide pedestrian crossings along the corridors and to, uh, to, correct, to try to correct them uh, with uh, flexible bollers when we could um, and to reinforce the fact that it was a corridor scolaire. This is the example of l'école du nouveau monde. When I was talking about specific measures, 
uh, this is a, a good example. Uh, this was an exit of a school before the project. And uh, it's hard to do only wayfinding when we see these kind of, um, uh, of infrastructure of the built environment. So we also allowed ourselves to do some improvements and to have money on the side to, uh, to create some missing sidewalks uh, when necessary. Um, I said before that uh, we conducted surveys uh, during the pilot. These surveys were primarily aimed at parents and teachers. Uh, they really helped actually assess the, uh, the impact of the measures and were a good source of inspiration to make some adjustments. So the key questions were if the respondents noticed the measure and if the respondents uh, thought that the measure had, had an impact on driver's behavior or uh, had an impact on, on people's behavior in general. So as you can see for the wayfinding signage, over 96% of the respondents noticed the new signage. Uh, as for the impact, 65% uh, only uh, indicated that the signs have had uh, a little to no impact. So uh, at least for driver behavior, of course, it reinforced the fact that there was a corridor for, for the children, but it was not the most effective measure to have a, an effect on, on the driver's behavior. Um, in the opinion of the people that responded to the to the survey, so uh, a good example uh, of results uh, is also about the flexible bowlers. So, eighty-eight percent of the people noticed them along the school, the route to school, and sixty-eight percent actually indicated that the measure had a big impact. Uh, for marking, we had 70% of people that noticed uh, the improvement of marking, and 45%. Uh, thought they, it had a good, big impact and we also assessed whether or not speed radar and it's connected to fines for drivers so <laughs> generally it has a good impact 70 percent noticed the photo radar even if it was only implemented in three of the five schools of the first phase and 53 uh, percent thought that it had a big impact so um, we had some adjustments uh, from the pilot and the extended project that I will talk a bit later about. Uh, so since the 2017 uh, to today, there, there had been several adjustments and improvements. So we are now exclusively, we're using specific corridor, uh, scola corridor scolaire bollards uh, so that uh, we have the advantage to reflect the wayfinding signage. Uh, we integrated information about the project in a safety campaign, and we also included the, 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 the corridor maps on the website. The, actually, the, the safe route corridor maps are distributed in most of the schools to children at the beginning of the school year as well. Uh, some measures were dropped. Uh, an example were um, the symbol markings that uh, showed not really big results. And finally, we took advantage of the project to update the snow plowing maps uh, and the priority of uh, snow plowing along the corridors. So since the project, the pilot project, uh, we, uh, the two year pilot project, the council actually agreed to extend to the entire uh, schools, private public schools of Gatineau since to December 2018. An average of $10,000 was allocated per school based on the cost estimate during the pilot. So 10 schools in 2017 and 18 during the pilot. Eight schools were done in 2019 and we're working on 12 schools this year. So 33 schools currently have a ST STP and we, there are nine in progress. So here are some numbers. It's a project that will affect the close to 65 schools in the future. We have five schools in, in development, elementary schools. And um, we contribute, the city contributes uh, to the realization of the school travel plans. Uh, I think it pays about half of the plans. It's a bit different in Ontario, I know. Um, and we set aside uh, $10,000 per school uh, to, uh, to finish them in 2023. The communication campaign uh, allowed us to piggyback on another initiative and to reduce the cost. So we only had to set aside $15,000 for the communication campaign. Basically, um, it's really a, a collaborative effort inside and outside the city, but I wanted to highlight here who was doing what in the city. So the planning department uh, leads the planning phase. 
uh, in this phase, we choose the targeted schools, we review their corridors, and we draft the recommendation. The recommendations are discussed internally with uh, the police and infrastructure department before moving on the implementation phase. And uh, from that stage, the infrastructure manages the, the marking borrows quantities, the RFP process, purchase, et cetera, et cetera. And the evaluation and follow-up phase uh, are now also led by infrastructure, but uh, besides uh, the, the survey that stays in, uh, in urban planning. We also collaborate with Mobio, as you can see on the, on the, on the left, sorry. Uh, Mobio is our local partners that realize the school travel plans and, uh, and connects us to the school and to other regional partners uh, for that process. So key successes. Um, so basically it's a project that's really appreciated by elected officials, parents and citizens for a relatively small investment in our opinion. Um, parents and school administrators who actually see the signs along other corridors also want to be part of the project. That helped to accelerate uh, the, the process. Most schools that didn't have a STP and saw the signage across the city wanted to, have, uh, 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 wanted to be part of the project. And one of the criteria to be eligible was to have a STP. So they, they kind of started the process uh, with us. Uh, now it's a project that is more and more integrated in our city traffic calming program, which helps save cost and, and increase efficiency. Uh, information about the project was integrated with the existing communication campaign, as I stated earlier, that really allowed uh, uh, communication to be set more quickly and more efficiently. And it's a project that was uh, implemented on time and budget. It's good to hear. So in the challenges uh, for the city demanded uh, resources and requires communications across several departments. Um, it's, uh, besides the survey, it's sometimes a bit hard to uh, assess the impact on behaviors on the ground. Uh, so we can conduct surveys, but the behavior is a bit hard to measure. Um, that's, what, that's what we found out. We, we have some counts, but it's not as easy as uh, one could think. Remaining parking issues around schools due to drop off So there's still some issues around the schools, uh, movements of cars that are pretty hard to, uh, to control sometimes. Um, it increases the maintenance costs and uh, the lack, when there is a lack of sidewalk along the routes to school, it's a bit hard to uh, promote uh, that, uh, that route or to, to do something with just signage and small measures. The lesson learned, so the project has to be combined with an awareness uh, campaign to increase uh, active modes. Um, that's what we have in Gatineau. We also have other initiatives and we really include this initiative with other in, uh, engagement and uh, education, the education piece. We finding size uh, are now installed on in the 500 meter radius of the schools to reinforce the message where there are many children walking and reduce costs and uh, visual clutter. Uh, we had started uh, up to 1.5 kilometers, but considering the fact that we have 60 schools, we did an analysis that we're, was showing that it was going to be a bit overkill across the city. Uh, flexible borders uh, have the most impact on behavior according to service, but there's still an issue because we have to remove them in the, in the winter. Um, the project is intended only for public uh, primary school and we have received some, some requests and some interest from private schools, but still, we still have to uh, develop an implementation strategy. And um, it's really like uh, what Markham and London were, were saying before, uh, it's really a work that has to be done co collaboratively inside and out the city with the community, with the schools, uh, the police department is really uh, a big key actor uh, for the awareness of the success of the project. And this is my great animation to say thank you.
So thank you, Francois. Merci beaucoup. Um, I know I noticed a couple of questions in the chat box that were directed at you. One of them I think you might have now answered, but I would encourage you to uh, to take a look at those. And thank you for unsharing your screen. And next uh, up is our final presentation from Sheldon Koo with the City of Toronto. Hi, everyone. Um, just going to share my screen. Just bear with me here. I'm uh, using my daughter's laptop, and she uh, uh, doesn't have a Power uh, Microsoft Office installed. So there's lots of great questions uh, happening in the in the chat box, which is great to see. Okay, can everyone hear me? Yes, I can. Sure. And you can see the slides. I can. Can also see some of your your tabs open, but um, I don't know whether you have a presentation view or whether we'll just go with that. Um, yeah, I'll have to get used to this. It's okay. Uh, well, we can certainly we'll see the slides. What we have, yeah. yeah. If you'd like to proceed, that's great. Sure. Okay. So I'm just going to give you a quick uh, rundown and overview of our um, active school travel wayfinding project um, here that we installed in Toronto. Um, and I'll put a little bit more emphasis on the engineering or the physical interventions aspects of the project, but I will also uh, touch upon some of the other aspects of the project uh, very briefly. So apologies, some of the graphics don't show up uh, again because uh, I don't have my own laptop. I'm not using my own laptop here. Um, uh, but basically, just want to start with a quick summary of how this project came to be. Um, it was basically the culmination of three different streams of activity that was happening in the city around the same time that brought our group of stakeholders together. Um, first is in 2016, City Council approved the Vision Zero Road Safety Plan, which is our city's strategy for eliminating all traffic-related fatalities and serious injury collisions, and is uh, based heavily on the Vision Zero principles that were originated in uh, in Sweden. And this plan focuses heavily on protecting vulnerable road users and identifies seven emphasis areas, including one of which is uh, school children. And around the same time, uh, Toronto's two public school boards, the TDSB and TCDSB, also introduced their own programs to promote and encourage active school travel. Uh, the TDSB's school traffic management program aims to reduce traffic congestion in front of schools and increase non-motorized travel. Um, and it's basically their own version of school travel planning. Both boards also adopted their own version of active school travel charters around that time. And then lastly, Toronto Public Health Unit um, increased their efforts to promote healthier lifestyles and encourage active school travel. Um, and that include, their work includes leadership for the Toronto Active School Travel Hub and direct engagement with schools by their public health nurse teams. Um, the Toronto AST Hub is actually a group of government and NGO partner agencies that work together to advance AST and that group includes uh, Toronto Public Health, Transportation Services, Green Communities Canada, TDSB, TCDSB, Toronto, Pub, uh, Toronto Police Service and CultureLink. In 2017, Toronto joined the Bloomberg Philanthropies Partnership for Healthy Cities Initiative and we received grant funding to develop a policy or program aimed at reducing non-communicable diseases or injury prevention. And this led to the development and implementation of our initial active and safe routes to school pilot project back in 2018. In 2019, our hub was approved by the OAST fund to receive grant funding as well as to receive additional funding. As well, we received additional funding from Bluebird Philanthropies through the continuation of our involvement in their Partnership for Healthy Cities initiative. And this is basically our two funding partners for this year's expansion of our pilot project. Um, the original pilot project was launched in three school areas involving three, uh, five schools. Um, this year's joint funding will be used to expand that pilot to four new schools and three school areas. Oh, sorry, this slide is not working. Um, so basically, uh, this is just outlining the approach that we took. Uh, actually, let me try this. Okay, so there's a, there's a graphic missing, sorry. So basically this is, uh, outlines our approach and it follows the five E's just like everyone else um, who's presented has, uh, has uh, uh, indicated. Um, so that's the education, 
um, so the engineering, the enforcement, the engagement, and the evaluation. Um, and basically this entails physical interventions, including the development and installation of new signs, sidewalks, stencils, and pavement markings throughout the local neighborhood. Um, it also involves the education awareness tools uh, or the development of them, including advertising to promote AST and the development of new teaching resources. Um, it also involves engage engagement with the parent teacher committees. Uh, and these were very helpful, particularly with planning the actual routes to the schools that we uh, finalized, as well as with uh, parents and students, uh, particularly in terms of the education campaign. Um, and also involves evaluation of the impacts on AST levels. And I'll get into that a little bit later. To help us select appropriate schools for the original pilot and also for this year's expansion of our pilot project, uh, we developed a set of criteria. Um, and the slide just basically shows you that. Um, the first requirements are that uh, it had to have been already approved or prioritized for our school safety zones programs. Um, and it had to have been enrolled in the school board's school traffic management program. And these were sort of key uh, parts of the puzzle. Um, if the idea being that it's important that we make sure that these areas are safer or we have more safety improvements if we're going to be increasing the level of participation in walking and cycling. And the school, traffic, uh, the school traffic management program piece of the puzzle is that we just wanted to make sure that there was a sustainability in terms of that ongoing engagement uh, with the school community and with the students um, after the uh, improvements are installed. Some of the other considerations were that uh, we looked at clear route options, uh, the current walking rates um, at the school, uh, the percent living within walking distance, the uh, learning opportunities index, which is basically the equity piece um, to, 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 to take into consideration schools in uh, disadvantaged areas. Um, reasons why schools would be a good fit, or specific reasons why they were a good fit. Um, challenges at the school site, and this included things like absences of sidewalks. Um, the level of engagement with uh, the staff, the parents, and the students, and as someone else has alluded to, that's a really key important piece um, to make sure that there is a, a chance of success um, with these programs. And then we looked at the distribution across the city in terms of where the uh, schools were located, trying to get some equal uh, distribution. And the result of that were these are the four schools that we selected for um, the expansion of the program is Hillmount, George Webster, Gene Lum, and Bishop McDonald, which are actually, uh, it's a new uh, type of school facility in Toronto where the Catholic and the public schools are housed in the same facility. Uh, so we're effectively killing two birds with one stone here. Um, just a quick word about the School Safety Zones program, why it's so important, um, I just want to mention it. It's one of the first programs we launched in Vision Zero, and basically it's a set of safety enhancements that are installed relatively quickly at the frontage of the schools um, all across the city. Um, we install them at about a rate of about 80 schools per year, and the objective here is to raise the conspicuity of school zones, increase driver attention, slow down traffic. And um, this is just an example of how these elements are laid out. We have flashing beacons with our new school zone signs um, at the entrances or the gateway features. Um, and adjacent to those um, would be the uh, school stencils um, painted onto the pavement. Um, next in order, you'll see the watcher speed driver feedback signs. These are basically LED signs that measure and display the speed of traffic to oncoming vehicles. Um, and then we also implement zebra markings at um, basically all of the stop controlled side streets um, in front of the school or within 150 meters of the school, which is what we consider the school frontage. Um, and this is basically mirrored in the other direction on approach to the school. Something new that we're doing this year is the city has designated community safety zones in front of all schools across the city. Um, and this is basically to support oncoming, uh, what is coming uh, very shortly in the near future, um, automated speed enforcement. Um, and something very new, uh, we haven't started yet, but this is something that's in development for, uh, for the future, is we're installing flexible in-road traffic calming signs, or flex signs, um, on approaches to schools where they meet our criteria. And again, this is uh, key to making the school zones, uh, the frontages of the schools safe.
Okay, um, once we uh, identify the schools, we go through a process working with our Green Communities Canada partner and the parent teacher committees um, or school administrators to identify and map out suitable walking and cycling routes. Um, this is something that we do in-house with help with our partners. And what we take into consideration are things like where the locations of protected crossings like traffic signals, pedestrian crossovers, um, stop controlled intersections and school crossing guards. We take a look at where students live, um, looking to maximize these routes and the use of these routes. Um, the locations of sidewalks, um, we will consider locations where there's only sidewalk on one side. Uh, we try to avoid locations where there are no sidewalks whatsoever. Um, and we also look at um, preferred walking routes um, through discussions with uh, parent teacher councils and um, we'll consult with our partners uh, Communities Canada with those councils to confirm those walking routes before we finalize them. Um, so now just get into some of the more specifics in terms of the engineering improvements. Um, so we, we classify them in basically two different groups of, uh, of, of improvements. Uh, those that are aimed primarily at students, uh, pedestrians and cyclists to encourage uh, walking and uh, biking and to promote safety. And those that are aimed more at the drivers uh, to keep heads and cyclists safer. Um, so we'll start with the AST encouragement signs or the wayfinding signs. These are signs basically to identify the school routes. Um, they're motivational signs. Um, they're installed at the five minute, uh, 10 minute and 15 minute walking times um, or the distances corresponding to those walking times um, along these routes that we've identified. Um, and you'll see that they are pretty colorful. They're cartoonish. They're meant to be appealing to children and young families. Um, and they're more inviting that way. And the colors help to convey a sense of progress. There's a sequence to the signs. There's a purple uh, that you'll, you'll see the blue signs first, then the green signs and the purple signs as you get closer to the school. Sorry, the other way around. Purple, green, and then blue as you get closer to the schools. Um, we used a walking speed of one meter per second, which is basically the walking speed we used to time our traffic signals in the city for seniors and uh, younger children to determine those uh, distances. Um, and the biking times were basically based on a scan of some um, literature reviews on uh, cyclist, uh, cyclist rates for children. Um, and I believe it's a 3.5 meter per second uh, rate that we use to determine those. In terms of the activity stencils, uh, these are basically um, placed along the school routes, uh, painted on the sidewalks. Um, again, taking inspiration from the city of Waterloo, who had done this previously. Um, and they're basically aimed at children to make walking a little bit more fun and educational. We use a variety of patterns, as you can see here. Um, and we have developed specifications for eight different patterns. Um, they are installed at regular intervals in between driveways. Um, and we've grouped them into what we consider low activity ones and high activity ones. And I'll get into that, uh, the reason why a little bit later in my presentation. Uh, next are these uh, school routes safety signs, um, which I think some people in Ontario, some of you from Ontario probably have seen. They've made their way elsewhere um, in our province. They're basically aimed at drivers and are intended to alert them to the increased presence of school children along these routes that we've designated and to encourage them to slow down. Um, they're also installed at regular intervals along the routes, um, at the start of the routes and at any point where there's a change in direction on the routes. Um, we've also installed safety messaging stencils um, at traffic signals and pedestrian crossovers along routes. Uh, and these are basically aimed at pedestrians to remind them to push the button and activate the signals um, in order to cross the streets safely. They're installed on the sidewalk bays directly adjacent to the push buttons uh, with, at every signal on PXO. And lastly, um, zebra crossings. Um, we've expanded the use of zebra crossings to all the stop controlled intersections along the routes. So they're used quite extensively in some of these neighborhoods where we've um, implemented um, our active and safe routes to school pilot. Typically, they're only installed at uh, traffic signals, PXOs, and um, at the frontages of schools as part of the school safety zones program. Um, but as a result of these pilots, these some of these neighborhoods will receive a lot more of these. Um, I should mention um, that we've, for all these signs and pavement markings, I just uh, um, showed you. We've developed best practices guidelines and specifications 
um, for the use of all these signs and payment markings, and that's to help us in terms of maintaining some consistency when we apply them. Um, they also help us um, in terms of developing plans a little more quickly and, and when we decide to expand these into the future to other schools. Uh, but mostly um, we use them to um, uh, outsource the planning, the design work to consultants to help us uh, when we expanded this program to the four new schools this year. Um, and that those guidelines basically cover off uh, aspects um, of spacing um, in terms of using existing poles, um, in terms of preferred locations for some of these activity stencils, for example, the use of side lotted properties or frontages to parks or apartment buildings uh, just to maximize the, the distances um, that we can implement these, uh, these stencils on. And then lastly, I'll just touch base uh, very quickly on the education um, components um, and communication components. Um, so as part of our plan, um, we are going to conduct an official media launch event at one of the schools with city officials, um, possibly uh, the mayor and other dignitaries. Um, and we are planning to advertise uh, about AST um, on bus shelters uh, around the schools uh, through Facebook and Twitter and in local ethnic newspapers. In terms of the outreach, uh, we're planning to work with CultureLink to adapt their bike rodeo events to include a pedestrian safety component, which we're now referring to as our active transportation rodeos, uh, to be conducted at the four new schools this year and also go back to the original five pilot schools and offer it to them also. Um, these are generally limited to students. So as a result of that, we're also looking to planning some community, community engagement nights at each school, um, which are mainly to draw in pedestrians and, and their families to learn about AST and, and road safety. And lastly, the public health nurses are uh, working with peer leaders in the schools um, around AST promotion and awareness activities, as well as uh, increasing their efforts um, on larger events, such as walk to school day, winter walk day, and bike to school week. As part of the work that we um, that we're doing at each of these schools, we also develop these take home packages, um, which we'll be doing, uh, which we did at the original schools and we'll do, do, do this year again. And this is basically an informa information package that includes a map showing all the designated school routes, the safe crossing locations, the locations of all the signs and activity stencils and safety warning stencils around their neighborhood, and provides some information about the project and the benefits of AST. Um, in the bottom corner, you'll see that you know, we went through the extent of actually translating some of these for um, schools where the communities, the local communities um, don't speak English as their um, home language. Um, and, there's, and therefore there's a bit of a, a communication barrier there. Uh, we did evaluate um, our initial pilot and we, can, we will plan, we are planning to evaluate this year's expansion. Um, unfortunately, the evaluation that we did in 2018, 2019 uh, was done with the kids' hospitals, and the findings were somewhat inconclusive. Um, we actually had some inconsistencies in the things, the metrics that we used for that um, that study, um, and, and it's really a part and parcel with the fact that um, our pilot was very small. Um, we had a very limited sample size and we had very poor response rates and this is something that we're hoping to improve this year um, with uh, our help with help from green communities canada um, but that's still a bit of a work in progress there's really nothing that we can report at this moment in terms of challenges and successes um, some of the things that we learned are there are challenges with uh, regards to older areas in toronto where the streets have no boulevards um, and the concern here is that we're promoting children to walk and bike uh, very close to traffic. Um, so one of, the, one of the things that we consider doing is uh, dividing the stencils into low activity and high activity stencils. And we'd be using the low activity stencils um, at those types of locations. Um, those are things like the ABC and the number lines as opposed to activity, high activity stencils, which are more of the running and the skipping and the hopping type stencils. Something else we noticed are there are sight line obstructions at driveways with people who have vegetation very close to the sidewalk blocking their visibility to children that are approaching on the sidewalk. Um, the only thing I can recommend is do field checks using street view or uh, or to actually go in the field to confirm those locations and be prepared to use different stencil types that are more low activity or prepare to 
actually relocate them all together to other locations when you come across that situation. Um, we also ran into some problems with planned sidewalk reconstructions when it came to um, installing some of these painted treatments on the sidewalks. Uh, so we worked heavily with um, our road operations crews to try to anticipate those and either delay or accelerate the painting work. Inevitably though, um, with so much um, reconstruction work going on in the city, um, we did find that some of them were replaced with fresh sidewalks, um, not to our knowledge, which we basically had to maintain um, the year later. Uh, actually, we're doing that as we speak. Um, something else I alluded to earlier is the language barriers. We do have a lot of communities in Toronto with uh, high, high immigrant populations um, where, where English isn't spoken at home. So we ended up having to translate a lot of the materials, including some of the advertising materials that we developed in different languages. And we worked with our partners, again, the Green Communities Canada, to work with the schools to identify those uh, most commonly spoken languages. Um, someone else alluded to size sign. Um, I think that's something in terms of a lesson learned for the City of Toronto too. Uh, we did find that some of the signs were a little bit on the small size. Um, got some comments about that. Um, so in the future, we'd consider using larger signs, both for the wayfinding signs and for the school route signs. And lastly, in terms of maintenance of the sidewalk stencils, uh, we did experience some wear and tear. We did an evaluation uh, recently, just after the uh, winter, and found that up to about 50% of the sidewalk stencils had worn out over the winter. And that's because we do sidewalk clearing in Toronto here. Um, and it was also partly to do with some of the sidewalk reconstruction where they, they had actually placed sidewalk bays entirely. Um, so that's something to be, uh, be prepared to, to, to address in the future um, in terms of working with your roads, departments and budgets to, to accommodate for replacement of the sidewalk stencils. Uh, we found that the signs were fine, um, no wear and tear on the signs after a year. Um, and even the, the, the zebra markings were fine. Those are thermoplastic, durable thermoplastics that are installed. Um, so mostly um, this is really pertaining to the sidewalk stencils. Um, we used yellow traffic paint, um, mostly because this was a pilot project. Um, so if we needed to remove them, we understood that they would wear um, on concrete. Um, if you were to look at installing these more permanently, um, I would ask, I would recommend that you consider actually using concrete paint. And I believe there are products out that are specifically for concrete use that would stand up through winter. Uh, we don't have experiences with those, but that's been some of the feedback that we've gotten. In terms I, of the successes... I, Sheldon, yep. just, just Wallace, I need you to wrap up in about two minutes if you can. Yeah, sure. This is the last slide. So oh, in terms of successes, uh, they were well received. We had no complaints from property owners and a lot of interest from uh, schools in other areas. Um, we developed a lot of new resources, uh, including an active and safe school school teachers kit, uh, which is basically full of curriculum ideas for teachers, um, and our Vision Zero safety guide for school children and parents, which is now distributed to schools. Um, and lastly, we did have some evidence that some of the schools were integrating the use of these signs and markings um, and our plans and our maps in some of their learning curriculum. So that concludes everything. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Sheldon. I'm just going to move back to my poll, uh, sorry, my, my slides. So we've had uh, lots of questions in, in the chat box and I know some of them have been uh, answered. We have a few that we are gonna cover in the Q&A session, but just before we do that, we have one second very quick pop-up poll, we're just asking you very quickly to uh, rate this uh, webinar. And again, your responses are anonymous. I just have to find the poll, there it is, okay. And that's the wrong one. My, my apologies, folks, there should be a second poll which is not reappearing, so I'm not going to, uh, I'm not gonna worry about that. Oh, there it is, sorry. Let's try that again. There we go. You just have three options, so this should be pretty quick. And your responses are anonymous, so please be honest. And then we're gonna to move to uh, some of the questions that uh, remain to be answered. Last call for any further responses. 
I'll give it another 10 seconds or so. See a few other people still answering and it looks like that's it. So we are pleased to see that at least for the vast majority of you that uh, the, the webinar has been, uh, has been useful and, and relevant and informative for you. So that's, uh, that's great. Great, so on to our uh, Q&A now. Um, as I say, some of the questions have already been dealt with in the chat box, but uh, my colleague Selena has pulled out some that remain outstanding. I'll ask all of the presenters just to unmute themselves. And some of these questions are directed uh, at particular presentations, but if anyone else feels they want to add something to the response, feel free. So um, this, this question's for you, Rena. Uh, do you think in this climate, and I'm assuming we're referring to the COVID climate, you could have meetings with parents, teachers, and school administration virtually um, who are interested in wayfinding and then have the municipalities install the signs over the summer? Do you want to take a crack at that? Uh, definitely. I've already, had, um, I've already had interest from parents who have been participating, you know, asking, um, asking us to set up virtual meetings. So I think so long as the parents and the teachers are willing, we could definitely do so. Um, we didn't involve um, the parents um, in our uh, location um, selection. It was, it was really the school board working with the municipality. Um, but I mean, it's definitely an option so long as the parents and the staff are willing to do so. Great. There's another question for you, Rena, but I, I invite anybody else. I think this could go to any of the presenters. Would uh, a jurisdiction or a, a municipality ever include a street without sidewalks on a designated school route? Could start with Rena, and if anyone else wants to uh, jump in, please do. Well, I think that's what I was trying to highlight. Um, some of our older communities, um, we ran into that challenge where, you know, across the street, um, there were no sidewalks and, you know, we had a heavy population of students coming from um, from those streets and a lot of parents actually parking on those streets and you have all the kids walking on the road. Um, so it, it definitely is there in the older neighborhoods, the newer neighborhoods. I don't think so anymore because there's policies that are uh, in York Region I'm aware of um, where they are insisting that the that their sidewalks being built into our newer neighborhoods. Um, I don't know if anyone else has a different experience. Does anyone else want to quickly jump in on that? We, uh, in Gatineau, Francois from Gatineau, um, yes, we, we, we kind of have the, the same problematic uh, for some schools where the, the shorter route to school or the more, the most used route to school sometimes um, uh, have no sidewalk. Uh, what we have is a program that identify uh, the missing uh, sidewalk links so that they're highly prioritized in the new, the, the future infrastructure uh, project. And on the side of that, uh, we, uh, we kind of work with uh, parking uh, restriction and uh, try to create some uh, sidewalk with uh, paint, but that are also available in the winter and safe in the winter. But it, it is a challenge. The built environment is, is sometimes not ideal at all for, for walking around the schools. Okay, and this question is for you, Francois, uh, regarding the, the flexible bollards that you install uh, you know, out into the, uh, into the intersection. Uh, are bikes supposed to go around them or between them and the curb? Yes, so it, it depends. That's a good question. It's a, it, it depends of every intersection is different. Uh, for many of these intersections, it's uh, it's uh, traffic coming from local streets and and uh, and uh, with very low traffic or where there are stop signs. So uh, sometimes the cyclists do have to go around it, but it's not on a street where that po would pose a, a safety problem. But in many cases, we assess. Uh, especially along the most used cycling routes, what uh, where the flexible borders can be to um, to not pose a, a problem. the the issue The issue that we saw and where the borders are really necessary is when and it, we have lots of uh, cases in like that is when the the radius is very large, uh, the the cars really accelerate uh, while turning, and that really poses a problem and for cyclists and for, and pedestrians. But 
but we we are aware that for some movements of cyclists sometimes it's not completely ideal and we try to take that in consideration great and and another question for you francois and uh, i think um, sheldon could weigh in as well you you may have responded to it francois but i'll ask it again it was a question of whether the bollards are removed during the winter months yes and that's that's one of the key issues with the routes to schools for for most uh, cities we, we we know that they're very efficient but we we do have the winter in in canada unfortunately sometimes and um, what we do uh, with the bollards is basically give the shape of the inter, uh, to the intersections that we would hope to these intersections to have uh, these intersections in the future when the roads are remade uh, will be transformed, uh, hopefully, uh, with uh, curb extensions and some improvements to the crossings. crossings. Uh, we understand that in such small projects, it's not possible for cost uh, reasons, uh, but uh, at least during the, the, the seasons that is most used for walking, it's, uh, it's more safe. But we, there is an issue in, in the winter, for sure. Okay, thank, thank you for that. Um... Just going through the other questions that have come in here. Uh, question, I think this is for Sheldon. Question, uh, question just about uh, some of the measures that you're implementing as part of your, your school zone traffic management uh, initiative, which includes the wayfinding. Uh, are there any raised crossings or other measures for those with limited visibility? Hi, Sheldon, are you still there? And you are going to unmute you. Hi, Sheldon. We can't seem to hear you. And I can't seem to unmute you. So we'll have, have to come back to that. I'm unsure. Sorry, Wallace, but can you hear me now? Now we can. There you go. <laughs> I don't know what happened there. Okay. Um, no, so the Active and Safer to School pilot project doesn't involve any um, physical traffic calming per se, um, but it's something that we are exploring in terms of our school safety zones program under Vision Zero. Um, so those are those safety improvements that we install um, uh, directly at the front edges of the school within 150 meters of every school. Um, it has to be a candidate location and it's coming out of our Vision Zero budget. Um, they do take a lot longer to implement, but my understanding is that we have started to look at some schools for things like raised crosswalks, but it's outside of the active and safer school pilot project. Okay, and here's another question. It was, um, it was posted while you were speaking, Sheldon, but I actually think it's a, a question for all of you. It's quite interesting. It's actually one that I had jotted down as well if we were short of questions. And it's with regards to the, uh, the link between um, these wayfinding initiatives and, and wayfinding signage at different distances from school and the concept of, um, of, um, of the kiss and, uh, not the kiss and ride, sorry, but the, the drive to five or the park and walk uh, initiatives, which are often part of school travel plans as well. For those are on the call that aren't familiar with it, it's the idea that for parents that want to continue to drive their children to school, you identify locations at uh, the approximately five minute uh, distance, walking distance from the school and encourage uh, parents to park their vehicles there and then their children uh, complete the journey on foot. So the question was about whether in your wayfinding initiatives you have uh, perhaps thought about or somehow incorporated that that approach into, um, you know, the locations where you uh, put your signs, you know, so that there are, there would be parking opportunities for for that type of uh, for parents that would like to do that. And I open that up to anybody who'd like to. Yeah, um, uh, maybe I can jump in. Uh, it, it's not a, it's not uh, implemented in Gatineau, but uh, it's it's definitely an issue we have around schools with the movements of the cars, as I, as I stated in my presentation. Um, what we are trying to do with uh, some schools is, uh, is to, um, to have them uh, help us identify some drop-off locations that are ideal and ideally out, not necessarily at 500 meters, but at least not on the streets of the schools and not obligating, finally, or pushing people to take their cars towards the school. And that's generally the issue. People come with the car in front of the schools and then turn around and there's several movements. So it's not necessarily in 500 meter radius, but we are working currently with some schools 
to try to identify some sites. I'd say one of the big challenge is the impact it has on residential uh, parking and the work we have to do with councillors and the residents to uh, kind of set aside some of the parking spaces for the, for the drop-offs. Great, thanks Francois. Does anyone else want to add? Yeah, this is uh, Rena from York Region. Um, yeah, we definitely encourage the use of the signage as drop-off locations. It's a way that we've marketed the program. Um, and I think that was one of the goals of having the five, 10 and 15 minute um, points. We've said those are ideal drop-off points and it, it's supposed to give parents that sense, you know, it's only 10 minutes. We don't have parking restrictions um, where uh, those signs are, our parking restrictions are mainly in front of the school. So usually the streets that are adjacent to the school. Um, obviously we, in, we encourage parents to look out for any signage, but um, I, think, um, I think we also need to work a little bit though with our communities and our counselors, um, because obviously when there's a, a lot of parents parking on the streets, you start to get those complaints, but um, you know, having all those cars in front of the school um, it's just not safe. So we definitely um, are trying to keep the parking restrictions low um, in those five, 10 and 15 minute zones. Great, thanks, Rena. Hi, wanna... Oh, sorry. Uh, this is Jill from the City of London. So um, with the HEAL Lab, we've been working on some um, drive to five programming and guidelines for schools to implement sort of like a best practices um, sort of thing. And we've also had issues like Francois uh, and Rena with people who will, you know, if we have a location mapped out about five minutes, um, typically it tends to be in uh, residential areas. And so some of the neighbors have been a little bit unhappy with that. Um, so we're working through issues like that. Um, but what we found has been working quite well has been locating parking lots um, at, you know, public parks and um, sometimes, you know, church parking lots, things like that, or local businesses that if we get in contact with them are, are happy or okay with us parking um, and dropping kids off in the morning and uh, after school. But um, signage has been helpful for that as well, though we haven't implemented any um, physical sort of um, um, things like parking spaces yet. We have been doing some benches and uh, signs, but that's about the extent so far. Great, thanks, Jill. I'm, uh, I'm keeping a close watch on the clock and we have come up to uh, the end of our allotted time for uh, this webinar. So that is going to be the last answer to the last question. Uh, just before we wrap up, I first of all want to thank all of our presenters. Uh, we can uh, have some silent online clapping uh, for them. Really appreciate them taking the time to uh, contribute to today's uh, webinar. Um, I, I think we had four really unique and very informative uh, presentations and it's, uh, it's really appreciated uh, to have partners like this uh, come forward and uh, share with, with everyone. Um, so I wanna thank them. I wanna thank all of you that have joined the webinar today. And just uh, the final screen there, you can see all of the ways that you can stay in touch with us at Ontario Active School Travel. And if you are also interested in learning more about the Ontario Active School Travel Network, which is our province-wide community of practice for active school travel practitioners, then uh, please visit the link uh, shown on the screen. So it being 2.30, I will wish everyone uh, a great rest of the day. Thank you for joining us. Uh, take care, stay well and uh, we hope you'll join us for uh, another webinar in the future. Thanks again, everyone.